Thanks for listening to the Zane Batla podcast. We officially have merch, and right now 100% of the profits are going to PCRF, Palestine Children's Relief Fund. We got hoodies, we got t-shirts, and again, 100% of the profits going right to PCRF. Don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe. And I want to thank you for supporting my work. Pervez Aguan, what are you running for? Why are you running? Uh, you know, you've been a huge name in the political um, scene in Houston. Um, would, would, would love to hear about, you know, your political aspirations and journey. Thank you for having me, Zane. I really appreciate it. Uh, so we're running for U.S. Congress District 7. It's a new district. Uh, it's the largest Asian American, Arab, Hindu, Muslim, Indian, Pakistani uh, population in the state of Texas. It covers Fort Bend County. Uh, and since it's a new district, I think it deserves new representation. Uh, this district now is 80% black and brown and minority communities. It's the most diverse district in the entire state of Texas. It has the largest population of uh, Pakistanis and Indians and Muslims and Arabs. Uh, and quite frankly, I think it's important we get our voice out there. You know, I'm running for Congress. Uh, elections coming up February 20th, voting starts. Uh, grateful to be here. No, and I, I appreciate you taking the time. Um, what inspired you to run and say like, you know what, this is the time for me to step up to the plate and really represent this district? I think two things. Uh, number one, I, I don't come from a family of means. You know, my father was a blue collar worker. Uh, mom looked after my brother and I at home. I, I don't come from a, uh, a wealthy family. Growing up uh, right down the street, we're in Gulfton right now. Uh, you know, I went to Madrasa, <laughs> right down the street, Madrasa Islamia. Uh, you know, I've seen what it's like to struggle. Uh, my dad, he moved us over to Sugarland, Mission Bend County uh, when I was much younger. Uh, but coming from a working class family, you know, my dad drove a forklift. He drove a cab when he came here in 1979. Uh, dad didn't have many means. Uh, when he passed away, he didn't have health insurance. It was very tough on my family. Uh, he struggled heavily with the cost of his health care at the end of his life. And I think seeing that firsthand, the systemic failures that really plague people, especially in these neighborhoods, 40% of families with children where we sit right now live under the poverty line, right? This is one of the most uninsured zip codes in the state of Texas. It's unacceptable to me that people go bankrupt when they get sick, people can't afford the care they need, and in the richest country on earth, no one should go bankrupt when they get cancer, no one should go bankrupt if they get sick, right? And I wanna fix that, and my experience with my father's healthcare struggles woke me up. But I think the second thing is look at the state of the Ummah right now. Look, 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 when you see what's happening in Gaza, when you see what's happening in Kashmir, in Pakistan, when you see what's happening in Yemen, in Syria, how can any young Muslim of conscience be okay, right? I think we've hit that point uh, you know, in the Quran, Kuntum nasi ta'muruna bil maruf. We enjoin what is right, we forbid what is evil. I think it's our moral imperative and duty as young Muslim Americans to stand up, fight back, say enough is enough, and I, you know, I'm doing what I can. I'm honored I get to serve the community, that you guys choose me uh, you know, to uh, represent you, uh, and I'm really looking forward to get to Congress to put our voice there. And you brought up two very important issues that a lot of people are concerned with, the first being health care, and the second being foreign affairs, and of which that falls under... Uh, the Gaza, uh, Israel, uh, the ge genocide that's essentially happening against the innocent people in Palestine. Um, I know you're running against an incumbent. Where does she stand in these two issues in particular? So her incumbency advantage, my opponent, was lost when the district was redrawn. 80% of the demographic of the district changed. The district is us, Zane. It's our family. It's our people. Right? It, there's almost 45 mosques in this district. It's one of the largest Palestinian populations. Right? It's unacceptable to me that my opponent refuses to call for a ceasefire, is proudly endorsed by APAC, the Israeli lobby, by the DMFI. They're spending thousands of bucks against me because I stand for one simple thing, humanity, human rights. I think it's unacceptable she won't call for a humanitarian ceasefire. She's openly touting that endorsement, and I think it's disrespectful, and quite frankly, uh, I, I think it's out of touch with the new constituency. And, and for us, as, as young Muslim Americans and people of other faiths, people who believe in the Palestinian cause, who believe in Palestinian liberation, who believe in fundamental human rights, we believe in fundamental human rights, an end to the occupation, an end to apartheid, an end to Israeli crimes committed against innocent men, women, and children. We believe that there needs to be a free Palestine, there needs to be freedom of movement, there needs to be a friend to an there needs to be an end to an occupation, and quite frankly, that will not happen as long as we let sitting Congress people like my opponent Fletcher stay in Congress. And when it comes to issues aside from uh, foreign affairs, I think you've made your stance pretty clear that you stand with the Palestinians, you stand for an end to, this, um, to the violence, calling for a ceasefire. Um, when it comes to issues that people in Houston 
whether they're Muslim, non-Muslim, issues like healthcare, issues like homelessness, issues like uh, affordability of a home. A lot of people are moving to Houston and seeing that they're concerned with, am I ever gonna be able to buy a home? Um, these issues are at the forefront of not just Houstonians, but uh, mm -hmm. uh, you're essentially gonna represent the rest of America in Congress as well. Um, so wh how do you differ in your beliefs and those avenues uh, when it comes to, rel uh, in comparison to your uh, opponent? Our campaign is different, Zane. We don't take a cent of lobbyist money. We don't take a dime of corporate money, not even a penny from any special interest groups. I don't respond to Wall Street. I don't respond to APAC. I don't respond to oil companies. I don't respond to the real estate lobby. This is a campaign for the people. It's a grassroots campaign. I believe it to be an ethical and alhamdulillah halal campaign. Right? Well, people powered. And the way this country changes is we get people elected who represent you and not big money. Right? So the way we differ is, quite frankly, this is the richest country on earth. No one should be sleeping on the street. Private equity companies, real estate developers should not be funding your politicians. So they write policy that benefits them. We need immediate public housing assistance. We have a low supply of housing in this country. Your average college graduate is burdened with debt. They go into the job market. That job market still does not allow them a salary to purchase a home. Right? Home prices have skyrocketed because of the shortage of housing. That's unacceptable to me. We need national policy that can immediately relieve people of that student debt. We need national policies that can tackle egregious wealth inequality. This is the richest country on earth. But still, 1% of the population owns more wealth than the other 90%. 20 families own as much wealth as almost 80% of Americans. Elon Musk and Jeff Bezos are building rocket ships to space, while me and you, if we drive five miles from here, we have people sleeping on the streets. I find that to be unacceptable. That's not the America my dad came to. That's not the American dream. The American dream is unattainable for so many. And our job is to not help political donors. It's not to help billionaires. It's not to help lobbies. It's not to help corporations. Our job is to make life easier, right? For those who don't have much. That's, that's what our deen teaches, right? Our Islam teaches us that we have to look after those who have nothing, right? If we see a problem, we solve the problem. If we see a problem, we don't turn away from it. If we see injustice, we don't run away from it. We run towards it. And, and that's why I run this campaign, because I think it's important to give a voice to the voiceless. I think it's important that people believe that change can happen. I still believe that change can happen. My dad came here with $5 in his pocket in 1979. He drove a cab, he washed dishes, he drove a forklift, he drove an Uber. You know, and here I am, Mohammed Pervez, running for U.S. Congress. I think anything is possible, and I want people to believe change is possible as well. And I really do hope that the change is possible with you and your campaign. You are against a very powerful force. And these forces are APAC, big oil, um, you know, the real estate industry, um, various industries that they see someone like you running the campaign that you are, and they say, no, there's no way we can have someone like Pervez in office. How has your campaign handled things to make sure that you are being elected, you are connecting with the people, you are gonna represent the people that, um, that when you get into office, you're actually taking their considerations and concerns in mind. It takes a lot more money for the big lobbies to spread lies than for us to spread the truth. We go door by door spreading a message of change. Hey, do you want to get money out of politics? Would you fight for universal health care? Help us fight for environmental stewardship, which is part and parcel of our faith, right? The earth was given to us as an amana. It's a trust that God has entrusted us with. We can't pollute it, we can't destroy it, and we're plundering its finite resources. I think part of the 99 coalition that you're a part of, uh, it's bringing these values back into the mainstream. You know, 12 months ago when I started my campaign, a lot of people said it wasn't possible. You know, a lot of people came up to me, Zane, and they said, don't talk about Kashmir, don't talk about Palestine. Pervez, if you want to win, take the middle path. Don't talk about getting lobbyist money in politics. Don't run on the Bernie platform, and I'm proud to run on the same platform, right? They said, Pervez, you don't have a chance of winning unless you can appeal to the average moderate voter. And I said, most people in this country aren't moderate. They want change from their government. They realize the thing doesn't work. 12 months later, here we are, you know, from working out of my garage, we had a two month old baby boy at home, my wife and I, we had our team working out of my house. 12 months later, you're sitting here in my office, we have 45 people on the staff. We've raised and spent $1.6 million. All grassroots, don't let anybody ever tell you, don't let anybody ever say we can't run grassroots campaigns that are successful. 12 months later, we've knocked 200,000 doors. 12 months later, I'm proud to say we have enough votes to win, we just gotta get them out. And when it comes to uh, tactics that your uh, opponent has done throughout this campaign, I know politics can get very messy at times, and I'm sure that um, throughout this campaign there have been certain 
uh, allegations that have uh, you know surfaced and um, I guess what I'm wondering as or probably a lot of people in Houston are wondering is what is the legitimacy of all this and is this something that um, should I as a voter be concerned about or is this something that's just misinformation from uh, the opponent's campaign? First, it just did not happen. I refuse to even acknowledge things that are so disgusting and egregious as this. This is ridiculous that they would come and smear our campaign and try to paint us as something that we're not. We're a grassroots campaign. 40 people, almost 20 of them have been with us for nine months. They can attest to the fact that Number one, we're working hard and we're fighting for the issues. You know, I, as a father and a husband, I refuse to sit here and let the media make a circus of it. They want to distract us from the truth, and the truth is that this campaign is fighting for systemic change, and I will not stand idly by. I will not, I refuse to, while they do this. If they want to take us out, they're going to have to come here and do it themselves, because we're not going anywhere. No, and uh, thank you for providing that uh, context and light. Um, w when it comes to the mobilization plan going forward for anybody listening who says, hey, this guy, Pervez, he sounds great. He has a lot of uh, promises that I want to see happen in Congress. How do we make sure that, you know, on November, uh, you're essentially granted the representation of uh, Texas 7? So whoever wins this primary wins the seat. The real election starts next week. February 20 is when voting starts. The election is now. Whoever wins the primary goes to Congress. Statistical guarantee. It's a safe Democratic seat. So what we need to do is make sure all of our cousins vote. You know, more than anything, I was at a Maimon wedding in Sugarland last week. There was like 2,000 people there. Right? If everybody just brings their cousins, we win the race. You ever been to yeah. Philly Cafe on a Friday night? Oh, of course. What yeah. about La Pasha? Uh, La Pasha, Kawa House now. Like, you see all these. Listen, all I got to do is send a bus to La Pasha and Nara, and that's half my votes. It's done. Right? We, gotta, we just got to make sure our people vote. We have the numbers in this district. We have the people. We have the people who believe in what you and I believe, which is a government that's ethical, that's not run by lobbyists. You know, people always say, Aguan is this, Aguan is that. Uh, you know, how can I trust him? I've spent the last year of my life, day in, day out, just running a grassroots campaign. We've been offered lobbyist money. We've been offered corporate money. We've rejected it. Heavy sums of it, because I want to show you and I want to show the 99 Coalition, I want to show voters in Houston that people can run painful, difficult, but fruitful and rewarding and ethical grassroots campaigns. So our record has been clean for the last 12 months. We have maintained our word. I've, I'm trying to stay true to my promises and show people that we can elect our own into government. It's not a perfect system, and I'm not a perfect man, but I'm working so hard to give you the representation and the people the representation uh, that I feel uh, could make them proud of what the U.S. government could be. You did mention that you know, this is the race that's important, um, you know, this, because it's a heavily Democratic uh, rep rep represented area, um, basically whoever wins this election is almost guaranteed to win the election in November. Are there concerns that if you do win this upcoming March uh, primary, that, oh, APAC and Big Oil and all these other um, uh, influencers and uh, corporations start pouring money into the Republican uh, nominee for the for the district? That's a good question. Our team is so laser focused on winning this March 5th primary. I can't even think about what's happening after this. You know, we're in position to win and I mean that. We can and we will win because of people like you and our community that have uh, the ability to get out and vote in the numbers we need to win. The votes are there. Many people have said yes to us. But, you know, APAC raised almost $100 million. They offered someone $20 million to run against Rashida. Last year, Summerlee won her primary and they came back against her in the general. They do not want, and when I mean they, big oil, Wall Street, the big lobbies, especially the Israeli lobby, they do not want people with our platform to run and succeed. They will try to silence us in any way they can, and I'm not going to let it happen. I'm going to put everything I can out on the field, and you know, the Super Bowl was last night. Uh, our team's going to win. What are some notable organizations or progressives, um, either at a federal level or state level, uh, whatever level, that you have uh, garnered some support from? So, uh, you know, one of the uh, most well-renowned progressives in the country, uh, Keith Ellison, uh, has formally endorsed us. We've gotten a lot of local organizations as well. Uh, you know, just recently we won the Fort Ben Tejano Democrats. I think the most important thing to realize is it's not endorsements that win a race, but it's the people in the district. And we've gone door to door, phone call by phone call, mosque to mosque, mandir to mandir. We've gone church to church, garnering support for a, for a novel idea. And I think this really needs to happen. A money, uh, sorry, a politics where money is removed. 
money can no longer be a part of the equation. We can't have politicians that are bought and paid for before they get to office. It's unacceptable to me that most of our politicians are purchased and bought and paid for before they even get to Washington. We need term limits. We need clean elections. We need campaign finance reform. And more than anything, we have to keep running grassroots campaigns. So when it comes to you know, this election, obviously you win the seat. Great, inshallah, amazing. Inshallah. Inshallah. God willing, God willing. inshallah. You get into Congress inshallah. day one. What would you, Pervez, Congressman Pervez Agwan, do in Congress for the next two years throughout your term? Three main priorities, right? Uh, and I think you have to split them up, right? Federally and locally. It's important for me to be someone who is helping the people in the district. So three main priorities there. And then federally, what can I do that no one's really trying to do? And people need to start pushing that conversation. So federally, number one, we have to get back to Congress people putting bills on the floor for clean elections, right? Codifying the overturn of Citizens United, number one. We have to have campaign finance reform immediately. We have to have publicly funded elections. Number two, we need term limits. We need to get people out of there. It's important, I'll put those bills on the floor. Number three, national renewable portfolio standards. What are we doing? Wind and solar are the cheapest forms of electricity available today. How come we're still building coal and natural gas plants? It's because the oil lobby is really strong. How come Texas, we can't build transmission corridors? Our state legislature is purchased by natural gas companies. This is fact, PUCT and ERCOT, right? Uh, if you, I was writing a book on this, so I can go on and on. The whole podcast could be just this, hey, yeah. right? But we need national renewable portfolio standards. The federal government has to step in and build the infrastructure to move us to an immediate, we don't need 2050 net zero, we need 2035 100% renewable energy grid. So I, you know, my background is in clean energy. I used to teach economics in clean energy. This is my bread and butter. I'd want to go in and start pushing environmental sustainability policy immediately. And third, most important foreign policy is really important to me. I want to put bills on the floor to sanction the Netanyahu government. I want to put bills on the floor to make sure we end any and all aid to any human rights violators. We're not just picking on Israel, we're picking on everybody. If you violate human rights, there should be no room for our tax dollars to go to you. We have to end the wars. We're spending a trillion dollars on war a year. Our Department of Defense budget is greater than the next nine countries combined. If you cut that by half, that should be going to schools and hospitals in this district. Now locally, uh, number one, free healthcare clinics. Short of universal health care, which we're going to push for, right, we have to bring federal dollars to set up free health care clinics in this area. Number two, Houston needs infrastructure spending. We have to have money for public transportation. Very, very simple. A train in Montrose, perhaps, right? Number three, we have to invest in the city. I want to bring 100,000 new clean energy jobs to Houston, and we do that with public-private partnerships and federal subsidies for a STEM campus that is an energy retraining center, and we'll be rolling that out pretty soon. And all these sound like amazing ideas. Um, you painted a great picture of what Houston can be, and a big staple of your whole campaign was Green New Hue. Um, there are some concerns, I feel, that maybe people know others in uh, the oil and gas industry that may say, like, hey, w there's a lot of concern around me losing my job or someone in my family losing their job because if we basically try to attack mm -hmm. big oil, uh, there's going to be concerns with job security in Houston. Um, is there some sort of, I'm, I'm sure it's within your infrastructure plan and your um, renewables plan because you are very heavily studied in the renewables and you, um, you know, uh, worked in that industry. Um, is that kind of what you envision for Houston in your green new hue? Good question, Zane. Uh, so what I would say is we're not anti-oil or oil workers. My dad worked in the oil industry. My first job out of college was in the fracking industry. I was an engineer in the oil and gas space, but you know something? The uh, stone age didn't end for a lack of stones. Oil would not, you know, oil age will not end for a lack of oil. We're gonna leave it in the ground. It's our moral imperative to do so. I don't know if you know this, but in the 2014 to 2016, then again, the COVID crash of oil, Houston lost hundreds of thousands of jobs that have never come back and they're never going to come back. Solar and wind are the cheapest forms of electricity available today. We don't need an energy transition in Houston. We need an energy revolution. And that only happens when we have policymakers willing to bring federal dollars here to make sure that the Houston of 2040 and 2050 is not going to be the Houston of 1980. This is 2024. We have to start thinking forward. And I'm proud, as someone who has an extensive background in renewable energy, to bring more jobs to Houston that are clean energy focused. And anybody that works in oil should not be worried about losing their jobs. We have to build alternative jobs that allow people to be proud of what they're doing. And quite frankly, uh, we have to leave the oil in the ground. We have to have bans on drilling and fracking. Humanity, if it's going to progress, if this society, if humanity is to progress, we have to stop burning fossil fuels. It's a clear imperative. We should not be shy. Uh, we should not be scared uh, that the oil lobby is going to come after us. Quite frankly, that's a good thing.
And these are all great points, and you bring a lot of solutions on Thank not you. just the federal level, but uh, for Houston um, on its on its own. Um, there is, I guess, already you know several progressives in the office, the squad, uh, people who may be progressive on an issue basis, um, reproductive rights, and various other uh, issues. But there's always that, uh, I guess battle between the corporate Democrats and the Repu basically the entire Republican Party. Um, there's always that battle of, hey, how do we get the votes? How do we uh, make sure that we are um, putting uh, mm -hmm. effective bills and effective legislation? Um, there seems to be a lot of barriers in place, especially with everybody in uh, corporate, uh, everybody on the corporate uh, side of politics. They could wear a NASCAR jersey essentially for how many corporate sponsors that they have. Um, so how do we push those uh, individuals in Congress to uh, basically side with you on the issues? So I think two things. First, we don't live in a society where there's two parties. I don't believe in the two-party system. We live in a corporatocracy. It's a one-party system. The same corporations, the same lobby groups are funding both sides of the aisle. If you look right now, APAC is funded by Republican MAGA billionaires, and they're funding Democrats in primaries against me, like my opponent. This is, this is absurd. It's absurd we live in a system where the same money from the same corporations funds both sides. This isn't a two-party country, it's a one-party country. And that one party, and that one party is lobbyist money. It's billionaire money, it's corporate money, and it's going to both sides, right? So number two, it's acknowledging that as the truth and realizing a win like this takes one digit off from the corporate side. And we're not anti-corporations, remember that. We're anti the way their money influences politics. And it adds one for the Ethical Progressive Caucus. Now, what's really important to recognize is, you know, I've been an organizer my whole life, and for the work I did in solar farms in Nebraska and Texas and Oklahoma, it's all about people. And I think you have to energize people. If you look right now, we're stuck between Biden and Trump as the two nominees. Uh, but, you know, there's a sentiment in America where people are feeling disenfranchised and they realize the system's broken. If you look at polling, 80% of Americans want universal health care. 80% want paid family leave. Almost 72% think uh, money is influencing politics too much. That's, that's like a super majority, right? It, 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 the American person, whether they identify as red or blue, we're agreeing on the same things. The polling for term limits, the polling for clean elections is just the same. What we have to do is get more people elected who are willing to shun the status quo, fight the establishment back, and our numbers go up. So my job isn't just to get in and put bills that Republicans will never sign. No, my job is to help find more people, and so is your job, that can get people mobilized across a message that ends corruption and helps the people. So it's not about working across aisles. I'm sorry, you can't work with a Republican party that is headed by Donald Trump and Chuck Schumer, uh, sorry, uh, by Donald Trump and Mitch McConnell. Right? And you also can't work with the Democratic Party headed by Chuck Schumer. I mean, oh my God, look at his stances on Israel. Right? It's about getting in and putting pressure and allowing the next generation to lead. Because I don't think this country will change as long as those people are at the top. So we get in and we put pressure and we organize and we build our numbers. So you have a very important election coming up and there's a lot of important dates. Um, to kind of close things off, uh, what kind of dates uh, and steps would you have for the viewers, whether they're in, their, in your district, and what can they do outside of your district? How can they help support the campaign? Everybody who's in district, you know, uh, aguanforus.com, check out the website, Sugarland, Richmond, Mission Bend, A Leaf, Sharpstown, Gulfton, Westview, Montrose, and the Heights. Right? It's a big 30 mile district. If you're in the district, voting starts Tuesday, February 20th. Uh, that's right around the corner. We have 12 days of voting. That's enough to win. Uh, there's multiple voting locations, aguanforus.com slash vote. If you're in the district, we need your vote. Please don't sit at home. Uh, not voting is a vote for my opponent who's funded by the Israeli lobby, who's funded by Big Oil, who's funded by Wall Street. I could really use your support. Our team has been working so hard. I humbly, sincerely ask them to come out and vote. Uh, if they're out of the district, uh, come into our office. Help us make some phone calls. You can do it remotely. Uh, you can sign up at aguanforus.com slash volunteer. Uh, you know, Zane, uh, it takes everybody to do this work. I can't do it alone. I'm honored that you, uh, your friends, everybody in the city has allowed me to do this so far uh, and thankful for the opportunity. No, and I you gave me a lot of valuable information to uh, write home about and, and tell everybody else in my circles. But I appreciate you coming out, Pervez, and taking the time. No, I no. hope you hope you win. Ah, me too. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> I would hope so. Yeah. Inshallah. Inshallah. Thank you, man. Thank you yeah, so much.